Blasphemy is a victimless crime, even in Nigeria. Welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist on Facebook Live. I'm Dan Barker. I'm co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And I'm Ryan Jane. I'm a staff attorney at FFRF. And today we are going to be talking about blasphemy laws and some of the instances of their recent enforcement. And Ryan, you are conversant with blasphemy laws around the world. And as we speak, Mubarak Bala, an atheist in Nigeria, has been arrested allegedly for blasphemy, although he's not been formally charged with a crime or allowed any legal counsel. Bala was detained in April, and he's still not free. We're going to discuss this alarming situation in just a minute with our guest today. That's right. And we're also going to be talking about uh, some recent developments in the uh, Charlie Hebdo case, which, as you know, had to do with blasphemy against the Prophet Muhammad as well. Uh, and so if you uh, viewers have any questions during today's live show, you can ask it in the Facebook comments or else you can send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. Joining us today from Nigeria is another Nigerian activist, a longtime friend of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, Leo Igwe. Leo has multiple degrees in philosophy and a doctorate in religious studies from the University of Beirut in Germany. Leo founded the Humanist Association of Nigeria and we printed one of Leo's articles in Free Thought Today a few years ago. It was called, Why So Many Africans Are Religious. Igwe's research focuses on witchcraft, on religion and atheism in Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, and Zambia. At the moment, he's devoting his time to campaigning for the release of Mubarak Bala and also working for the eradication of witch persecution and to foster critical thinking in the schools. So Leo, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to see you again, as always. You're friendly, happy face. You remember when we met each other? Yes, that was in Cameroon. <laughs> in Cameroon, your neighboring country there, right? Um, yes, yes, exactly. I think that was in 2007. We were doing a humanist conference uh, for the young yeah. student, students that were there. Um, exactly, yeah. It was in 2007, yes. And you've spent your whole life pretty much working for rationality, for science, for reason, oh. for women's rights, for religious freedom. Uh, what is it that motivates you to be so concerned about all of these issues, Leo? Yeah, because uh, growing up, I, I came face to face with the harm, the damage, the social impact, the negative social impact of irrationalism, religious extremism, and bigotry. And as we are seeing today, the case of Mubarak, in fact, what we are seeing in the case of Mubarak is just the tip of the iceberg. And that's why, as you said in the introduction, I share my time not just uh, between campaigning for, uh, campaigning for the release of Mubarak, but also campaigning against uh, witch persecution. Because whether it has to do with uh, campaigning against uh, blasphemy laws and um, religion-related persecutions, it is all about the what what is all about impunity. Those who act in the name of religion do not want to be held accountable. They always think that they can get away with it. Whether it has to do with persecution of non-religious people, whether it has to do even with the persecution of religious people, because let us not uh, uh, think that uh, it's just a case of religious persecution of non-religious. No. We have religious persecution of religious. We, we have a situation where Muslims persecute Muslims. Like uh, in Nigeria now, we have uh, a case whereby a young Muslim singer, 22 years, was sentenced to death just for singing a song, nothing more. The person sang a song, and they said that the song um, um, you know, had verses or lines that um, uh, disrespected Muhammad. 
And in Nigeria, they sentenced this young man to death. And the governor is saying that as soon as it is time, the, the, the period for appeal expires, that he would order the execution of a 22-year-old singer just for what they call blasphemy. So that is just an idea of what is going on. And we have also a 13-year-old boy who is also in prison, sentenced to 10 years in prison for making a derogatory remark about Allah. And you know, when they say derogatory remark here now, not derogatory remark about other gods, traditional gods, Christian gods, Hindu gods. No, it's always a special god. That is the Islamic god. Meanwhile, these uh, Muslims go around the whole world, around the whole country, declaring that there is no other god but their own god. Apparently committing the same crime, they are trying to convict others, you know, in, the, in places where they are in the majority. So you so, have serious is, problems in, in Nigeria right now. Uh, I, forgot, yes. I forgot to tell our viewers uh, where you are. You're speaking to us from Ibadan, is I'm, that I'm, right, in Nigeria? Yeah. Yes, I'm speaking from Ibadan, close to Lagos uh, in Nigeria, yes. So briefly, tell us what happened with Mubarak. Mubarak is the current president of the Humanists, which is a group that you founded, so you know him. Tell, tell us the story. What happened with Mubarak Bala? Well, Mubarak Bala actually um, came out in a very, what people may call, controversial way. What was that? In 2014, uh, he came out as an ex-Muslim. And that decision did not go down well with the family. So what they did, they sent him to a mental hospital. In other words, it takes somebody who has a mental issue to come out and say, I'm no longer a Muslim or I'm an atheist, or questioning God or Islamic beliefs. So they took him to a mental hospital, and luckily while he was there, he was able to send out some text messages to some like-minded people who rallied together, rallied the humanist, the free thought movement, and who were able to put up a campaign, and uh, he was eventually released from the hospital. So um, he continued with his work. It is a work of education, it's a work of enlightenment. That is what Mubarak is trying to do, because he understands the damage. And when I said this thing, I made it. He understands the damage. And let me tell you what he told me briefly before they arrested him. As soon as there was an outbreak of coronavirus, some Muslims were saying there was nothing like that. And they actually instituted a call, what they call the coronavirus football club. They, were, they organized a match and people are playing football, trying to win a cup against all the guidelines for the management of the pandemic, against social distancing, even against uh, you know, shaking of hands, wearing of face masks. So he was, he, was, he was always very angry, not very happy with the fact that in the name of Islam, many people want to get away with so much in terms of going against common sense, going against science, even going against human rights. So what he was doing was trying to educate and enlighten the people. And that was what was going on. He was making posts on Facebook, and eventually some of some Muslims who were not happy with him petitioned the police, who came and arrested him on, the, on April 28th, and they disappeared him since then. And he doesn't have access to a lawyer. He doesn't have access to his family. We don't know exactly where he's being held. We actually even don't know whether he's alive or dead. That's awful. If I can say, you know, in this country, that's at least something that we are largely past, you know, having to deal with the state seizing somebody and not telling you where the person is. I remember reading that even his wife is, you know, desperately trying, just pleading with the government, trying to say, where is my husband? They had a child who was recently born and the government won't tell her where he is. Um, that's just absolutely unforgivable. Um, Leo, can you, do we know, uh, is there, there haven't been any charges uh, filed against him, right? And do we know, would they be, because my understanding is there's two systems in Nigeria, right? Two court systems. There's a Sharia system and then a yeah. secular system. Do we know yeah. which system he would be in? 
Yeah, well, in Kano State, we have all these systems operating side by side. Okay, and when it comes to Mubarak, the state is in a dilemma. Because, first of all, he was born a Muslim. So he went against the norm by declaring himself an ex-Muslim. So we have never had a case in Kano where an ex-Muslim is charged of blasphemy. It is usually a kind of a fine line. A Muslim charged of blasphemy tried in Sharia court and under Sharia law and, of course, sentenced to death, as in the case of Yahya. Or you are a Christian, if you are accused of blasphemy, usually they don't allow that to get to court. The Islamic mob will take care of that. The person is killed and nothing happens, as we, as we saw in 2015 and 2016. A young woman uh, made a comment in the market, a Christian woman, and they said it was blasphemous, and they killed him. Sorry, they killed her right there. They slaughtered, they, 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 they just uh, murdered the woman right there in the market. And, um, and some suspects were arrested and taken to court. But the state prosecutor came and three months after that and said they had no case to answer. The case was dismissed. Nobody was brought to book up to today. So, so that's what we have. Either you're a Christian killed by the Islamic mob, or you are a Muslim. If you commit blasphemy, they sentence you to death and uh, you languish in jail, or, because that's exactly what we have. So that of Mubarak is, is, is completely out of the box, the two boxes. An ex-Muslim, an atheist, and who has blasphemed. So normally he's supposed to be charged under the state law where blasphemy is a misdemeanor, but that will not satisfy the Muslim establishment. That is why they just decided to disappear him and uh, put him out there, no access to a lawyer, no date for hearing, no date for future hearing, nothing. Nothing is going on. They just want him to languish and die there. That is, that is actually what we have when it comes to Mubarak's case. So he could and, face the death penalty, is that right? Yes. Now, look at the death penalty, look at how it could come. It could come by them allowing him to languish there without any, without any charge or allow him to be killed either by a mob in the prison or by some kind of a, uh, accidental you know, killing. That's it, because that's exactly what they want. Because if you are to charge him as an atheist, you will charge him under the state law where the punishment for blasphemy is maybe maximum of two, year, uh, two years imprisonment. So, and they will not be satisfied with that. So they, they, were, they, 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 they were unable to charge him in a, in a state, in the state court. So, and they cannot charge him under Sharia law or in a Sharia court. So what they are left with is just disappear him and um, not give him access to a lawyer and not bring a, a formal charge against him. And has the government told you anything? Do they even have a story that they are trying to, to say a, a, some sort of justification for why you don't know what's going on? Well, the thing is that the government, all of them are playing games with us. You know, they, they, um, uh, if you ask the police, the police will say, oh, we have charged the case to court. If you go to the court, they, could not, they, will, not, um, they, will, not be, they will not present him in court. So, because the lawyers will have to defend him if he's presented in court. Now, who will present him in court? The police. You go to the police, they say they have charged him to court. You go to the court, they don't find him there. So, this is what they have been doing since April uh, 28th, when he was arrested, uh, because there is no will to really prosecute him. The, the way they have the will is to punish him, to penalize him, and if possible, to find a way to get him eliminated, you know, and get him punished maximally and to satisfy the Islamic base who are behind the arrest and who are so upset that as an ex-Muslim, he could come out to say something critical of Islam. So Leo, I understand, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the Nigerian constitution guarantees religious freedom. So, yes. so isn't this blasphemy law unconstitutional? Yes, it is unconstitutional. It is unconstitutional because we have uh, uh, our constitution uh, guarantees freedom of religion or belief and freedom of expression. Yes. But what happens is that um, the, 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 this provision is being used 
by Muslim majorities, that is in, in, in states where Muslims are in the majority, to persecute, discriminate, and deny the rights of minorities, including other Muslim, Muslim minorities, uh, religious minorities, and non-religious minorities, as we have seen in this case. So the provision there is a provision that is being used to oppress and to tyrannize over the lives of minorities in the region. And now, because it is in line with the, 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 the desire, the demands of the Muslim majority in these places, it has not, it has not been, uh, we have not been able to challenge the unconstitutionality. So, but I think that with what is going on now, uh, that will have to, we will have to focus on challenging the unconstitutionality of blasphemy law. Because when they say blasphemy, like I said, it is not blasphemy against the traditional gods or Hindu gods or Christian gods. In Kano, it is only the uh, specific uh, Wahhabi Allah Islamic God. That is the one, that's what is being, that's what we are referring to. Because in the case of Yahya, Yahya is a Muslim. He belongs to the Sufi order. But he sang a song which is annoying to the Wahhabi Muslims and who think that for that he committed a blasphemy and that he should be killed. So it is not just unconstitutional, it is also a tune which is being used to foment uh, or, or, or to fuel intolerance and, uh, and violence and victimization of minorities. Well, and so one thing that we've done at FFRF, because those that's such a hard legal struggle, you know, I as, as an attorney in the United States, I can't even imagine the frustration of dealing with a system like that, where at least we can count on if there is a blatantly unconstitutional law, I can go to court and get a court to rule on it. You know, that's yes. something we, we, we have that's at least solid for the time being, at least in the United States. So yeah. what we are doing in uh, at FFRF is we are trying to apply international pressure to the Nigerian government, uh, which is something okay. that I know we've seen has been effective elsewhere, um, where when you have these instances of, you know, vigilante justice and the state is complicit, it's just allowing it. Um, the, the only tool we have, I guess, but it's doing what we can, is to try to get the international community, the United States government, the United Nations, to say these are unacceptable human rights violations and we expect you to fix them. So we sent a letter to the State Department last week uh, about this, uh, urging the State Department to demand that the Nigerian government uh, resolve this situation with, with Bala and at least explain what's going on. Um, but do you, what are your thoughts on the, the impact of the international scene? Does the Nigerian government respond to that? Is that a, a, an effective way for us to be pursuing this? I say yes, it is, because, of course, the next alternative is the local response or local pressure. I think that the Nigerian government, they yield more to international pressure in this case than local pressure. But I must say this, when the pressures are coming from the United States or coming from Europe, it is always seen as a Christian, a covert Christian pressure. In other words, an, a pressure coming from an uh, anti-Islam establishment or section of the world. But of course, that's what we have. By that, I mean that it is what it is. I mean, um, the pressure from the United States, the pressure from, um, uh, from Europe cannot just be brushed aside by the Nigerian government because there, there's a lot at stake if they do that. So when it comes to the issue of Mubarak now, um, I think that our hope lies on the international community, the diplomatic community, and international pressure like the one you just mentioned now, um, either coming from the United States or coming from the European Union. Uh, this, is, this is the kind of pressure that can get Nigerians to adjust and begin to take another look uh, at what, that, what they're doing uh, because, um, of course, there's a lot at stake when, if they try to go against such pressures, uh, because Nigeria is also, has also a lot of international commitment and international uh, programs going on. 
So I think that it is effective, and I think that we need more of such in order to help Nigeria to sit up and take measures against blasphemy laws. So Leo, I understand. I read that some experts from the United Nations wrote a very strong letter to the Nigerian government complaining that this violates international law. And yeah. the government ignored the letter. They just sent another letter recently. Do you know anything about that? Yes, I'm aware of it. You know, we've been working with the United Nations to see what we can do to persuade Nigeria to um, fulfill its obligation. Yeah, because what the United Nations is, what they're saying is that, I mean, somebody who is arrested should be prosecuted. Four months after, the prosec after arrest, no prosecution, nothing that all dilly darling, no, no clear steps to make sure that the human and constitutional rights of Mubarak uh, are respected. No. So uh, United Nations issued a statement and they wrote a letter. Uh, but it is difficult for some of us who are not within the circle of the government and the UN to know how the how how the how the Nigerian government is responding. But you know, given the fact that up till now, we still Mubarak's wife and baby they have not had access to their father for months. Given the fact that. Mubarak has not even had access to a lawyer, his lawyer, who's been there since April when he was arrested. We still think that the Nigerian government is playing the game and is not taking the United Nations seriously. And it is important that the United Nations step up its pressure to make sure that Nigeria uh, fulfills its obligation, not just to its own citizens, but its also obligation internationally. So I have one more question, unless you have one, Ryan, that you want to ask. Um, no, go ahead. So uh, before we take questions from viewers, uh, Leo, and thank you so much for giving us your time today. Um, you know Mub Mubarak because you are both involved in the same organization. So this is not just an yes. abstract issue for you. This is a friend of yours. This is somebody that yes. you care about deeply. Uh, can, yes. can you tell us briefly what else the... Nigerian humanists have been doing the last few years in, in, the, in your country? Well, what happens is that, as you can see in the case of Mubarak, it is not easy to be a humanist in Nigeria. Now, in the north, it's dangerous. If you are a humanist, you, you have to be quiet. You don't speak openly. Others can say, for instance, in the north, People can openly say there is no other God but Islamic God. But you dare not say there is no other God at all, including the Islamic God. In other words, you are meant to live as second-class citizens. We have not been able to organize much of our program in the North because of the fear, because of the concern that such programs could be invaded by fanatics and people could be attacked or killed. Many of our members who are in the north or Muslim-dominated areas cannot actively and openly identify themselves as humanists. So what we have been doing all, this, all these days is to get into a process of trying to help many of our members who are in these places where it is so dangerous to become a humanist or to come out openly as a humanist to find a way to meet. Some of them, we invite them down south to come and meet with us. Like now, the last time um, I met with Mubarak, that was last year in Abuja. The, the other time I met with him, it was in Lagos, which was in the south. So we have been trying to see, Abuja was the farthest we could go. That is at the center of Nigeria, in terms of organizing the program. And when we organize it even, and it, it does, Abuja is the capital of Nigeria. Even when we organized it there, there was a lot of fear that fanatics could invade our meeting venue and attack people and things like that. So we've been challenging, we've been trying to do our best to make Nigerians understand that religion is not by force. Yes, yes, you, you can't force people, everybody to believe what you believe. People should be free to believe and not to believe. So we've been working very hard, trying to open a conversation with religious leaders and religious organizations. Like now, we have reached out to the Muslim organization to have a meeting with them so that we begin to discuss a kind of Muslim kind of a, a relationship, partnership, and dialogue. But we wrote them a letter, they never replied. 
Why? Because they don't recognize us. I don't think they recognize us as even partners at all. Now, we've been, we, we visited the Christian uh, associations here. They received us, and we had some kind of dialogue. So this is the kind of thing we've been doing in the past years, trying to get Nigerians to understand, look, it's normal for people to profess religion, also to renounce religion. But unfortunately, what we have here is that people think you must, for them in the, in the Muslim sections, you, if you are born a Muslim, you must remain a Muslim. Now, if you, if you, leave, if you leave Islam, you, you, you are treated like a, a criminal. They think that you should be, you, you have a mental problem. We don't have mental problems. If we, by living in Islam, actually, it is a sign of, uh, of, uh, of uh, intellectual, it's a, it's a form of virtue for people to exercise their right to say, you know, they are not professing a religion at all. But this is very hard for many Nigerians. Yeah. This is very hard, even for Nigerian institutions, to uh, accept. So this is what we have been trying to do, to see how we can make being a humanist, being an atheist, less risky, more acceptable to the people and the, and the country at large. Now, it's not just Nigeria. A few years ago, you wrote an article for our newspaper, for Free Thought Today, about how uh, free thought all over Africa, you wrote why so many Africans are religious. Uh, it, are other countries in Africa experiencing the same problem? Uh, you've been working in Kenya and Zambia. Uh, and is it possible that there could be some international help within Africa uh, for Mubarak's situation? Yes, actually, it's not just in Nigeria we have this problem. We also have it in other countries. Yeah, but what we're having in Nigeria is, uh, if I should say, it's just a microcosm of what we, you know, what we have in terms of the continent wide. So we still in Gambia, in Senegal, in uh, in, in Kenya, and of course uh, in Uganda, in South Africa, and all those places, we still have uh, situations where many people who are atheists find it difficult to come out as atheists before their family members or come out as an atheist nationwide in public or, or even get people to um, know that they are atheists. So we have all these challenges. But I must tell you this, that the challenge is worse in Muslim-dominated areas. Yes. It is, it is less risky in where you have Christians who are dominant. Um, by saying less risky, it doesn't mean that you know, it's very easy for us. No. But it is a matter of life or death, life and death for, for people who are in Muslim-dominated areas. And that is why we, it's difficult to get uh, some kind of Africa-based mechanisms to support or to help Mubarak, because those people will have to also openly identify themselves. And nobody wants to do it because the consequences is enormous. It means you can lose your life, you can lose your job, you can disappear the way Mubarak disappeared today. So we still have a long way to go in terms of having a region, African-based mechanism that can be used to respond to situations like that of Mubarak. You do have friends in other countries. We've spoken with uh, Rosalind Mole down in Ghana. The Ghana humanists are a very active group. Are, are they helping you in some way in other countries? Yes, yes. Ghana has been very helpful, and they have been helping us with publicizing uh, the case, you know, uh, writing petitions um, and uh, highlighting the, the case on social media. But, you know, uh, it, of course, we, it's still a very small group. <laughs> it's still a very small group. But the, the Humanist Association in Ghana, they have, they have been very helpful. And uh, even in Uganda, in Kenya, uh, we have atheists in Kenya, they have also been very helpful. And some of our colleagues. But these are just tiny voices. Okay, these are tiny voices, but very important. Yes, is is uh, is um, is very important because it helps give us a kind of um, an Africa-wide kind of approach, an Africa-wide kind of mechanism and response. But but there is still a lot to be done. I mean, we have about 53 uh, um, African countries, and here we are talking about maybe about five of them where we have a few who are speaking. So. We still uh, need more of the, of the humanists in Ghana. We need more countries to have very visible, active humanist groups that can speak out when it comes to a case like this. Well, that's a huge job that you have. And I mean, if history is any guide, you know, I think of 
um, Europe when, around America's founding when it was, of course, not the same problem, but analogous, at least, where there was this Christian majority that was um, much less tolerant of non-Christians than they are now. And what I think of is that the, the uh, existence of plurality, when you had a uh, diversity of views, like you're describing, that certainly did help, where it becomes less palatable for the Christian majority to say, um, you know, we're going to condemn all of these various groups, and in your case, the Muslim majority. Um, but then the turning point I came, I think, came in America, at least, when it was the Christian majority themselves who started to say, we don't agree with you on these religious questions, but we at least think that you have the right to disagree with us. And so there became popular support for religious tolerance. So I think you're doing things that sounds like exactly right by, you know, forming coalitions with other groups, even though you also disagree with these Christian groups on, you know, theological questions, you're on the same side of these civil yeah. rights issues. And then you're also working with yeah. um, with Muslims, right, to try to get them to say, we don't need to convince you to leave Islam, but we have le we just want to convince you that yeah. you're, you shouldn't be murdering people just because they disagree with you. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we've been having this kind of uh, conversation because... Um, uh, there are, uh, in the north of Nigeria, it's not uh, atheists that are persecuted. Christians, in fact, uh, 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 virtually all the people that have been attacked and killed, uh, non-Muslims who have been attacked and killed in the north, uh, all of them, were, they were all Christians that were killed. It's, this is only the time we have a case of an atheist coming up. So uh, we are in conversation with um, the Christian minorities in, those, in these places, and um, we are also trying to get the Muslim majority, ma minority in the southern part to understand that uh, what is going on in the north is, um, is, uh, is also something that could affect them. So we are trying to build this coalition, but I must tell you, people are afraid. Yes, there's a lot of fear. Uh, so they support us individually, but they find it difficult to come out officially to put their face on their response and their support. So there's a lot of fear because of the fact that very often in cases like this, uh, the Muslim establishment um, condone violence, especially when they are done in response to issues like blasphemy or the secretion of the Quran. So there is a broad coalition of uh, people who are in conversation with us, who support us. But I must tell you that many of them want to lie very low. They don't want to show their faces because they know the consequences. In fact, the Christian Association of Nigeria in Kano came out in support of the blasphemy, yeah. the, the death sentence passed on a Muslim. They came out in support of it. You know why? Because they are afraid. Because they know that if they, if they don't do that, they would be you know, overwhelmed by the mob who would burn down their churches and things like that. So, but of course, a time must come when people must put their feet, stamp their feet on the ground and speak out against this. Otherwise, we are not going to have the change. So, so yes, we are having that um, broad-based coalition, uh, but there's still a lot of challenge because many people are afraid that um, you know the Islamic jihadists will get at them, kill them, or destroy or attack them. So, Ryan, uh, before we take questions, can you very briefly tell us what's happening today in the Charlie Hebdo case? Yes, absolutely. So. Uh, most viewers probably remember in 2015, there was the uh, attack on um, the Charlie Hebdo uh, satirical newspaper in France because they published, they, they had republished a Danish um, series of cartoons that were uh, making fun of the, the Prophet Muhammad. And so there was a horrible attack that um, uh, decimated the, the crew, the, the workers there at the, the newspaper. And um, that was five years ago now, but starting today, there is a trial uh, in France that is um, where more than a dozen people are being charged for uh, helping to set up and providing arms for these these attacks. So um, the newspaper has uh, uh, republished the same cartoons yesterday, which they have not been doing regularly. They made a point of saying they are only going to. They're they're not trying to you know provoke anybody. They're only printing these. Uh, potentially offensive cartoons when it makes sense to make this point that free speech will win and but you cannot silence us is the message they're trying to send. So yesterday 
they republished these these cartoons. And um, five years ago, FFRF supported uh, them, try to stand in solidarity with Charlie Hebdo. But that's a recent development that um, you know reminds everybody that, uh, as Leo was saying, this is not a, a problem that's only going on in Africa. This is still um, a, a global issue with blasphemy laws, both uh, state enforced and with vigilante justice around the globe. Well, but Nigeria is not France, so there's there's different levels of justice, aren't there, Leo? So can we take some questions? Are you okay with hearing from audience members? Yeah. Here's somebody, uh, David Stork asks, is an American citizen who publicly speaks or acts only in the USA in a way considered blasphemous according to another country's laws legally vulnerable if he or she travels to that country. Like what if, what if a, an atheist from the United States goes to Nigeria and defames uh, Muhammad? Well, I want to say that um, um, with what is going on, let me just give you an example. When we had the Danish cartoon, you know, many of us did actually know what was going on only we just had this riot going on and all that. But do you know that there were solidarity protests in Nigeria? Even by those who, who had not seen the cartoon and who didn't see the cartoon as at that time. So from my understanding of how uh, Muslims, especially in this case, react when it comes to issues of blasphemy or insulting Prophet Muhammad, Anybody who does it in America is claimed to, is seen as to have done it throughout the world. So the person can be attacked if the person comes to Nigeria. I have no doubt about it. Yeah, and I would add that, you know, the, um, you can try to make legal arguments all you want to say, I wasn't availing myself of the jurisdiction of this place. But when you're dealing with a situation where there's vigilante justice and the state is turning a blind eye to it, uh, those legal arguments are not going to do you a lot of good. Yeah, so be careful. huh? Yeah. So here's a question from Tom Page. Tom asks, how many skeptics and free thinkers are killed or jailed each year in Islamic countries for blasphemy? Do we know that? I don't know. I don't know. Um, like I said, in Nigeria... Even coming out as a skeptic is a challenge, yes. So, uh, because uh, in the case of Mubarak, Mubarak committed two crimes. For the, for the Muslim fanatics, he committed two crimes. He renounced Islam, and he was criticizing Islam. So, what happens is that many of them, with this double layer of, of criminality, many of them are either trapped at one layer or the other. So the second layer, which is where Mubarak is now, uh, not many, many actually survive it. Because we had a case in Sudan where uh, a humanist uh, was to fill the national ID card. And when he came to religion, he just filled out non-religious. That was all he did. And they, they, they arrested him and charged him um, for the, the, the charging for apostasy. And, uh, but he was lucky in 2017, they, they brought a, a psychiatric doctor who looked at him, who examined him and said, oh no, he had some uh, mental issues. So that was how the case was dismissed. But I must say that um, I think uh, this year, Sudan has um, abolished its um, blasphemy laws. But look, abolishing it on paper, is different from abolishing it in the minds of the people. So I still think it's still dangerous to go open and public in Sudan and in many places as an apostate of Islam. So um, what I'm saying there is that it's difficult to know how many people who are punished because of their skeptical views and thoughts. Because you need to really go through another level of criminality, that's uh, the, the, the level of apostasy, before coming out to express yourself or your views as skeptics or, or, or free thinkers. So it is choking. It is frustrating. It is like a cage, what we have there. So it's difficult to know how many of our, uh, of, uh, of our fellow-minded um, uh, free thinking 
uh, colleagues who are in jail as a result of either being called apostate or being called a blasphemer. So here's a question from Fabrice. And this is a question I have for you too, Leo. What makes Mubarak so interesting to the authorities? Why is his voice so threatening? Are there not Nigerians who do the same thing as him? And my question is, well, what about you, Leo? You're also a visible, outspoken critic. Uh, are you, do you have any fears? Yes, I do. And, um, and uh, first of all, uh, let, me, let me address the question. Why is it interesting is that up till the time he came out openly as an atheist, I've been organizing the atheist humanist movement since 1996. And I must tell you that we have members from the northern part, but they will always tell you, I'm in the closet. I'm in the closet. I'm in the closet. So what we have mainly uh, before Mubarak, we're just closeted humanists closeted atheists. So, but he was the one that came and said, oh, look, enough of this. Let's go open and identify ourselves. Let's organize, let's mobilize, the, you know, and uh, let's start bringing together people of like mind. There are, there are many, thousands of them, I understand, in those places, in the places where Islam is, um, is uh, really repressing and tyrannizing over the lives of young and elderly people. But Everybody is afraid because they know the consequences. So what happens is that why he's an interesting character in this case is that he, he's the first to come out and say, hey, in other words, you can be an apostate and you can be a blasphemer and still move around freely. This is something many find it difficult to contend. Many people will tell you they don't want to be killed. They don't want to lose their jobs. They don't want to disappear or you know, like he did today. So... So it's because he went against, in quote, the norm. Well, I don't call it even norm. He is, it's, it's not norm that is going on there. What is it? It's, um, it's unnormy. It's unnormy. He went against, in quote, the unnormy that is, has been accepted as a norm, which is that people should actually say who they are, what they believe, and, uh, and make their views open and public, whether it's critical of Muhammad or Islam or Christianity, as the case may be. So they found him as a phenomenon. In fact, last year, they organized a seminar on social media and the rise of atheism in northern Nigeria. And that seminar was targeted on Mubarak and the movement that he was leading in the region. So that is why they find him as a, as a character, as somebody of interest. Uh, but uh, I'm sorry to say that at the end of the day, the cat is let out of the bag. It's, a lot of people are, are, wake, are waking up, and I think that he has brought that needed change. And that process of change will continue. Thank you, Leo. If you want to say anything, Ryan, jump in. Um, oh, that's, that's great. I have nothing to add to that. So Nick Hazen Peterson has a question. How can United States citizens help the humanist movement in Nigeria? Is there an organization that we can send some funds to? What, what can we do to help, Leo? I think that there is, there's a lot we can do at the moment. Um, first of all is that I want, it's also, first of all, it has to be a change of attitude. Let us not see Mubarak as a Nigerian, Mubarak's case as a Nigerian case. No. Like, the first question we, uh, I think that was the first question uh, they asked about the dangers one who blasphemes in the U.S. could face. What, what the kind of thing Mubarak is going through resonates with what is going on when it comes to the global jihadist campaign, Okay. People want to, uh, according to them, this kind of Islam that will rule the world, hold people in bondage, and give uh, license to Islamic scholars to say whatever they like about other religions, but put in jail anybody who says the slightest thing critical of Islam or critical of Muhammad. You know, that's the kind of thing going on. So that they shouldn't see it as a Nigerian thing. So what they can do is that they should, first of all, like what you are doing right here now, give us a platform where we can exchange ideas, understand what is going on, look at the, how it connects with the situation in the U.S., and also how it disconnects and all that. So it is also important that people begin to support the, the international humanist uh, uh, movement, the humanist international, because 
these organizations are turning, you know, they are transforming into effective mechanisms uh, that is helping in mobilizing and organizing humanism. Because we need strong humanist organizations in African countries. We need robust free thought groups. Without robust free thought groups, we won't be able to, you know, gain their respect. Because what happens is that, look, they arrested Mubarak because they thought they could get away with it. But they have made a mistake. Yes. And we have to use all our network, local and international, to send a strong message to those jihadists, to those Islamists in Kano and in all places to understand that, look, freedom of religion and freedom from religion is a right. And nobody should be persecuted. Muslims should not be persecuted for saying there is no God but Allah. Muslim countries should not persecute anybody who says also there is no other God at all. And that if they stop at Allah, we are ready to go a God, a, a, a one God step more and all that. And now this is intolerable. Let us also not forget that in Pakistan, the person that was shot in court recently, the person, that, that guy was an American citizen. Yes. So, so it can also affect us right there. So when we campaign against blasphemy in Nigeria, when we work with activists in Nigeria or in other places to campaign against blasphemy laws, we are also campaigning against something that may come to hurt Americans or American interests sometime and someday. So I want them to see it not as our campaign, as Nigerian campaign. I want them to see it as American campaign. So let them rally with us, support us, so that we can defeat this kind of Islamic fascism, totalitarianism, and tyranny that is trying to destroy and disseminate, d d destroy people just because, you know, we, we are different, just because we hold views and ideas that are not compatible with Islamic ideas. Do the humanists of Nigeria have a web page? Yes, we, we have, right now, we don't have a web page at the moment, but we, we have, of course, we, have a, we, are, we are active on Facebook. But um, I know that any support that goes through the Humanist International for our humanist group, they will get to us. We are still struggling to set, some, set up some of these um, uh, resources because we should not forget that many people are, are afraid, you know, because of what is going on now. There has been a pushback on humanism because of the arrest of Mubarak. So we are trying to be careful how we go about our work. And um, I think that hopefully we will set up our own web page, but we are active on Facebook and, um, and Twitter. And, uh, but I think that any, res any resource that is channeled through the Humanist International will definitely get to us. So people can look up Humanist International online and use that international organization to help groups like yours then. We have one... And, uh, we have can, one I, can I underscore just a sure. something about that? Uh, the, so I definitely fully support that. I'm sure those groups need, need funding, so help support them that way, but also you know, people like Leo are sticking their necks out and risking their physical safety. If you're in a spot where you're lucky enough that you're not risking your physical safety, then use the the resources you have. Use your platform, your social media connections to help amplify their voices so that when they do stick their neck out like this, they're getting as much as they can for it. So I yeah. absolutely agree. That's a hugely important thing you can do. And then one other thing that uh, specifically you can do if you're an American is there's a great bipartisan uh, congressional resolution that you can urge your reps to support. And again, it's, it has bipartisan support. So even if you have a rep who is normally not great on state church separation, a lot of times they will uh, they will still support this idea. So this is House Res 512, which the title is calling for glo the global re repeal of blasphemy, heresy, and apostasy laws. So that would send a message to the international community that the United States Congress demands that these laws be, be repealed. So that's another thing you can do is reach out to your rep and ask them to support HRES 512. So Ryan, this last question for the day, I think we can direct it to you, unless you wanted to comment, uh, Leo. Sabrina Bornson is asking, have there ever been any blasphemy laws in the United States? And Ryan, is that a FFRF sticker behind you there that says, um, I'm secular it and is. I vote? Oh, okay. that's right. So here it is. Yes. So got to get my okay. my plug. Yep. There you go. You can get that, I believe, at the FFRF store. Yeah, so. <laughs> so has the U.S. ever had a blasphemy law? Yeah. The short answer is yes. Um, that there are various states that have outlawed blasphemy, and a number of states still have laws in the books that uh, say things such as uh, atheists can't hold public office. Uh, the 
the good news is that those are regarded as um, are, uh, artifacts of, of history. They, they are not enforceable. So they, they are still, um, uh, still around, still on the books, and the, it is a reminder of our, our, our history, not too distant. Uh, but fortunately, at least, the Supreme Court has, um, uh, has a, built up a body of jurisprudence that there is no court that's ever going to uh, actually enforce those. It just it runs so directly, so headlong into the First Amendment that you're not going to have any problems getting um, uh, getting prosecuted for for blasphemy or you know if you run for office and you're an open atheist and there's a law prohibiting that that's not going to have any practical problem for you. Um, but it is again a reminder that that's where we we were. And of course, uh, the law is a fluid thing, so you have to be careful when we are kind of sliding back in some of these areas, you could get politicians who say, you know, we have this law that's still on the books. It was good law before. We're moving in that direction again. So I mean, you never know. You don't want to take it for granted that this that these laws couldn't start to be enforced again in the United States. But as it is right now, that's the, the situation, is that there's some archaic laws that are still on the books, but nothing that's enforceable. And there are some places where those laws have been repealed, like in Ireland, of all places. They used to have a blasphemy law. Now it's gone. So maybe in Nigeria, Leo, that can be the next step to uh, correct these bad laws that you have in your countries. So, yes. Yes. so we're out of time today, Leo Igwe from Nigeria. Thank you so much for your concern, for your love for truth, and for your bravery. And thank you for joining us today. Do you have a final 10 seconds to say goodbye? Yes. Um, I said thank you so much for this opportunity and thank you, friends, for being there. And I want to say, look, let's do whatever we can to abolish blasphemy law and let's mobilize our governments, you know, to make sure that a blasphemy law becomes a thing of the past and send this message to Muslim-dominated uh, countries that blasphemy laws hurt them most and hurt them more. So getting rid of blasphemy law is also in the interest of Muslims, non-Muslims, as in the interest of humanity at large. The Freedom from Religion Foundation, of course, is battling these issues all over the world. And we invite you to join the Freedom from Religion Foundation. You can join us at ffrf.org. Uh, if you're not sure, you can ask for a sample issue of our newspaper, which we will mail to you, and hope you will join us in our fight for free thought. Join us next Wednesday at 12 o'clock noon central on FFRF's Ask an Atheist on Facebook Live. <laughs>